Thank you, everyone. Good evening. Thank you, everyone. Sorry. First things first, if you could pull this, this guy out of your pocket and turn it into lecture hall mode for the next hour, thank you very much. Thanks for coming in this evening and, uh, and welcome me back to the AA Beatriz Colomina. Uh, a dear friend, a very frequent visitor and lecturer here at the school for many years, uh, and indeed a very distinguished uh, architectural historian. I, by coincidence, was giving a Histories and Theories lecture two days ago he here at the school and halfway through the session stumbled upon the infamous line by Winston Churchill uttered in the 1940s, um, who said, and in fact more notoriously wrote, history will treat me well, he said, with, with an effective pause, for I intend to write it. And indeed, Churchill did just that, putting himself at the center of post-war historical life in the UK in ways that only that kind of a historian could. Beatrice Colomina is a historian that in my view will be treated very well by architectural history, not because of the way she will write herself into that history, but in fact for the way those of you and many other people around the world will write architectural histories in very large degree owing to her incredible um, project of the last 25 years that's brought architectural history back to life in an era dominated by technology and media in ways that often made the idea of history seem unfathomable um, two decades ago. Uh, her, her work since the early 1990s has explored architecture, you could say, in its most notorious era in the 20th century, in a time in which a few architects in this building and other places said that architecture, in fact, didn't deserve to continue to exist in the way that it had. So, so overtaken was it by changes to society, the arrival of new media, new interdisciplinary projects, all of which threatened architecture in ways that were almost unimaginable 20 or 30 years ago. Beatrice's work since then has systematically renovated the way architecture thinks of its own self and its own history, not just opening up new avenues and new conversations between architecture and related cultural fields, but I think more importantly has found a way to bring back to life figures like the pioneering uh, figures of early modern architecture in new and unexpected ways that don't just bring these people to life, um, but in fact demonstrate the own considerable complexity to how they themselves invented a modern architectural project. Uh, I think you will all know Beatrice's books very well. Um, Privacy and Publicity, published in 1994, was a first sustained uh, monograph length study on the uh, let's say duplicitous or, or uh, <coughs> conspiratorial ways in which architecture related itself to modern publicity and modern media. Um, it built upon work that I think began in the late 1980s as Beatrice settled into Princeton University, a, a first famous collection in, published in about 1992, Sexuality in Space, documented the work of, of a really groundbreaking conference and symposium held in Princeton at that time which really for the first time tried to situate not just the project of architectural history, but architecture, contemporary architectural life itself in a larger expanded cultural field. Uh, and her work ever since has just gone from strength to strength. The material that she's presenting this evening to give you a small backdrop um, um, doesn't just relate to the ongoing research uh, and work of her students in the PhD program at Princeton University, uh, at the Media and Modernity program that she directs there, um, but relates also to previous publications that's brought this research together uh, in forms that some of you would have seen. I'm thinking of uh, a 2004 publication, Cold War Hot Houses, Inventing Post-War Culture from Cockpit to Playboy, which started to map out the terrain of tonight's presentation. Uh, tonight is an opportunity for us to see an update on a brilliant body of work that's truly unlike any other in the field today. Please join me in welcoming Beatrice Colomina. Well, thank you very much for your very generous uh, introduction, uh, Brett. Uh, it's really very kind. And uh, thank you very much for being 
here in this Halloween night. I can't believe you choose Playboy over, uh, I don't know, dressing up or, so, <laughs> or something. Um, so here I am with uh, uh, Playboy. So in a way, yeah, Sexuality and Space, many people, is the first book that they uh, recognize. So I'm still interested in sex, obviously. And the total uh, interior is, of course, uh, a reference to the total uh, uh, work of art. And um, the question here is that the total work of art, in fact, is not necessarily uh, produced by an artist. In fact, it might uh, always escape the artist, even those artists that theorize uh, the total work of art, that aspire to it, never quite achieve it. So uh, uh, the paradox of the total work of art, then, is that it cannot be an artwork uh, in the usual uh, uh, sense, and it is perhaps that when we turn away um, from art uh, and from architecture, as we conventionally understand, that we might find ourselves in the middle of a total work of art, at least in the kind of expanded sense of the total work of art that I want to talk about uh, today. And I'm going to talk about this through the uh, Playboy uh, magazine in its first, uh, let's say, 15 years of, uh, of life. Playboy, as you will see, was relentlessly uh, obsessed with the interior, and this interior uh, turns out to be, as you will see, infinite. As Brett already uh, mentioned, this uh, was part of one of these collective uh, projects that I uh, undertake with my uh, PhD students and the Media Modernity Program, in which we work collaboratively on the subject, and uh, different students took different aspects of uh, of this uh, question of Playboys and were interested in, uh, in grottos. Uh, actually, Mark Briss that came out from, from this school and was obsessed with the, with the grotto in the 18th and 19th century found out that the grotto uh, was so important in, uh, in Playboy and his uh, contribution uh, was to that effect. And other people were, uh, Federica Vanucci was interested in, uh, in surveillance, in surveillance in Playboy and many, many uh, different aspects of Playboy. But I precisely, uh, concentrated on this question of the interior. So this is uh, part of this uh, kind of collective uh, work, but uh, what I'm going to, to present is my own take on, on this uh, theme. In terms of, um, of this uh, 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 broader uh, context in which uh, this uh, study is, is part of the question of Playboy uh, uh, architecture, this is, as I say, a collective, uh, uh, collaborative project that involves a number of, uh, of students, including Brit Ebersol, Federica Vanucci, Margo Handworker, Pepe Aviles, uh, Mark Briz, Daria Ricci, uh, uh, Daniela Fabricios, uh, and I think that's it, right? <coughs> and uh, it started with the kind of almost uh, simple realization, really a stupid realization. You wonder why nobody realized that before that there was a lot, a lot of architecture in Playboy uh, magazine, right? And, and in, you know, in fact, uh, you know, the magazine is well known precisely because of its articles and many people, there was this, this joke in the 50s that people read Playboy uh, for the articles. And in fact, if when you go through the, ma the magazines, it's, it's astonishing. I mean, there are uh, unbelievable uh, authors. You have uh, interviews with, uh, fantastic interviews with Marsha McLuhan, with Jean Paul Sartre, Salvador Dalí, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, uh, Fidel Castro, etc. You read amazing uh, writers like Norman Mailer, Ray Bradbury. I mean, uh, Fahrenheit 451 was serialized in, uh, in Playboy uh, even before it was published. Alan uh, Ginsberg, Jack Kerouac, and the whole Beat Generation, John Updike, Doris Lessing, Joyce Carol Ott, Hemingway, Talo Calvino, Henry Miller, Kurt Vonnegut, Nadine Gordimer, and any other author that you can imagine from this period and the art uh, in Playboy. Uh, but what nobody uh, seemed to have realized is that from the very beginning, also you see architecture there. So in the very first issues, you have Frank Joe Wright and Miss Van der Rohe. Of course, the magazine is being produced in Chicago, so they start with what uh, is close by, and Hefner knew uh, pretty well. But then they move through the whole 1950s uh, crowd of Eames, Arinen, uh, uh, I don't know, Bertoia, Elliot Noyes, etc., to practically echo all the developments of the 60s and 70s with. Uh, uh, articles and interviews with people like Charles Moore, uh, Anne Farm and the House of the Century, Bucky Fuller, Paolo Soleri, uh, Moses Safdie, etc., and etc. So uh, it, this is uh, 
uh, therefore a very important uh, uh, resource for the diffusion of architecture uh, because we are talking about a magazine that has seven million uh, copies. So imagine how many readers uh, is that. So in terms of the diffusion of modern architecture, you have to take uh, Playboy uh, very, very seriously. Uh, but it's much, much more than that. The interest of, uh, for, of Playboy for architecture is, uh, is really uh, uh, inseparable uh, from the beginning. So architecture and sexuality, you can argue, are really uh, uh, one and the same thing. Architecture, in other words, is not something uh, covering the magazine, like literature and politics and all these things that I just uh, mentioned, but is integral uh, to it. This is the thesis of the project. The sexual uh, fantasies and the architectural fantasies, in that sense, are inseparable. Playboy, in other words, cannot exist without architecture. And moreover, this architecture is all about the interior. And this is becomes evident in the very first issue with Marilyn Monroe in the cover and uh, the promise of her naked uh, body uh, inside. This is a, a calendar uh, picture that was never published and that Hugh Hefner bought for a, for a few uh, hundred dollars and put it in the, in the centerfold of the, of the magazine. And it's interesting also that uh, uh, Hefner didn't think that it was going to be a second issue, right? So he never thought that this would be successful, right? He, they didn't plan for a second issue. And it sold like 64,000 copies or something. But anyway, I said that the uh, architecture is already uh, in the first issue because in the editorial of that very issue, you see a cartoon that is all about the uh, interior. The Playboy is clearly an indoor man, and it's clear it's also interesting that this Playboy is also a, a bunny, a male bunny uh, at the beginning. And this is what the editorial board, uh, the editorial uh, uh, says. We don't mind telling you in advance that we plan on spending most of our time inside. We like our apartments. We enjoy, we enjoy mixing cocktails and an order row two, putting a little mood music on the phonograph and inv inviting in a female acquaint acquaintance <coughs> for a quiet discussion on Picasso, Nietzsche, jazz, sex, right? So there you have the whole, uh, uh, the whole setup, right? It's not really just about sex, it's ab about inviting this female acquaintance to have this kind of uh, cultural uh, uh, discussion about this, all this. So clearly the Playboy is an indoor man, uh, but you may wonder why do they say, I mean, why does the editorial say, we don't mind telling you in advance? I mean, what is there uh, to mind, in other words? Um, who, or, or what's there to mind, right? The editorial, in that sense, is very clear. They say, most of today's magazines for men spend all their time outdoors, thrusting through thorny thickets or splashing about in fast flowing stream. Are all very sexual images, of course. We will be there uh, too occasionally, but we don't mind telling you in advance we plan on spending most of our time inside, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? So, what is it that they are placing uh, themselves against? They are situating themselves against precisely the only male magazines that exist that are all about the outdoors, that are about this active man, and they are reclaiming the interior and interior decoration uh, for men, right? Which you may think, well, Okay, but it's radical at the moment. In fact, that uh, uh, this is uh, entirely out of their uh, of their. Uh, and it's most interesting also that it's modern architecture. So at the time that all the popular magazines were uh, actually almost phobic against uh, modern architecture, I think about Hassan Garden and that crazy woman Elizabeth Gordon, um, uh, talking about the threat to the new America. And the threat to the new America are all these emigres like me, eh, who had just built the famous. Farnsworth House uh, near Chicago, and that was seen not only bad because it's modern, but also a threat uh, uh, to America. So in this very context, in the very same year, that House Beautiful attacks modern architecture and presents as the threat to the new America, is the same year that Playboy starts, and from the beginning is promoting uh, uh, modern architecture and, um, and design. So uh, returning to this, uh, uh, a Playboy uh, uh, bunny. The Playboy is uh, obviously also uh, uh, a different kind of animal. He's also kind of a hunter, but obviously the metropolitan uh, apartment is his natural habitat. He knows everything about it and keeps adjusting it, as you would say, to better catch his prey. 
In fact, as you will see, he cares much more about the lure than about the catch. It is the apartment itself that is the ultimate object of desire. That is, the Playboy and his magazine are all, as you will see, about architecture. This uh, philosophy is embodied in the figure of, he, of Hefner uh, uh, himself, here uh, lying in bed in, uh, in his famous uh, round bed in the mansion, who famously never or almost never left uh, his bed, let alone uh, his house. He literally moved uh, his office uh, to his bed in 1960, when he moved into the Playboy Mansion in 1340 North State Parkway in Chicago, turning it into an epicenter of a global empire and his silk uh, pajamas and dressing gown into a kind of a new uh, business attire. <laughs> I don't go out of the house at all. I'm a contemporary recluse, he told Tom Wolfe, uh, guessing that the last time that he had been out of the house had been three and a half months uh, before. And in the last two years, he had been out of the house only nine times. So, and it's very kind of interesting, not this <laughs> voluntary uh, recluse <laughs> of modern architecture, precisely. No? It reminds you of the voluntary prisoners, right? So he voluntarily doesn't leave uh, the space of the house, not even the space of the bed. It's kind of interesting also to look at the images in bed where he's uh, actually clearly working there with his layouts and his uh, eating there with his candy bars and his uh, uh, apple, candy apples and all this, this stuff, right? But it's also interesting to see how the offices look before he moved into the mansion and into the bed because already he's surrounded by all these uh, uh, co uh, uh, workers, right, uh, uh, all playing in, on the floor, like if they were kids, right? And, and everything is on the floor, also practically making the move from the surface of the floor to the floor surface of, of the bed, almost inevitable. Also, you may want to know, I, I think it's very funny, that he says he moved the, uh, the office to, to his house because, almost like an architect, he was spending all his time in the office, he was sleeping in the office, he was eating in the office, he was uh, doing everything in the office, so why not to move uh, the office uh, uh, to the house? And ultimately, why not to move the office uh, uh, to the bed and not uh, uh, move uh, at all? So uh, here is in the mansion, and again in, in color photographs with the, in the mansion. And here, of course, is Tom Wolf who interviewed him for this uh, book, The Pump House uh, Gun. Um, fascinated, Wolf described him after this interview. He interviews, by the way, him in bed. Uh, naturally, everybody is interviewing Hefner in bed. Way before John Lennon, he is not moving from his bed. The journalist will come uh, to his bed. Fascinated, Wolf described him as the tender timpani green heart of an artichoke. Uh, it's also very interesting to know that when you look into it, Hefner really didn't go out when he went out at all. Uh, but he was brought in as a kind of, if you want, a succession of bubbles that are all designed uh, to extend his interior. Uh, so it's kind of an infinite interior that moves from the bed to this kind of outfitted uh, vehicles. The most interesting of one, of course, is the big uh, bunny. The big bunny is a, a stretch DC-9 that was designed, interiorly designed by Ron Dismith. The Ron Dismith is the architect uh, of the mansion, and which include, uh, let me show you the plan, a gourmet kitchen, a dancing floor, a living room, conference space, discotheque, a wet bar, a state-of-the-art in a mask of projectors, a sleeping quarters for 16 guests, and of course, have a suite with a sour and an elliptical uh, bed covered in Tasmanian opossum skins. And here is <laughs> <laughs> the suite of, uh, of Hefner all covered in opossum skins, and uh, Hefner with his then uh, friend girlfriend uh, Barbie arriving in Heathrow of all airports, right? And it's kind of beautiful because he is completely at ease in this environment, right? She cannot be more relaxed. And you can see him, it's a little bit more like, okay, you know, this is a bed, but it's not exactly my regular bed. And I'm, not, you know, like he can, that tension of having left his natural uh, 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 habitat is also clearly uh, seen in his, uh, in his film. You can also think about the home away from home of the, of the Playboy uh, clubs, starting with the Chicago club in 1960 uh, and rapidly growing from seven play clubs in 1963 to 17 by 65 and ultimately um, 33 uh, clubs. So here it is the Playboy 
a club in New York, in Miami, in New Orleans, uh, etc. And it's also interesting, those are terrible images, but because it's very difficult to uh, get good images of some of those things. But you know, you have to think, for example, that the Playboy Club in, in, uh, in London, Walter Gropius was asked to do this play. Why is not in the books of, uh, why is get uh, crossed out of, uh, of his books? I mean, I want to know, I want to go to his archives to find out now what does the Playboy Club of, uh, of Walter Gropius um, look like. In any case, here is Hefner uh, with the model of the Playboy Club and Playboy Hotel in, uh, in LA. And, and what is beautiful about these images is that Hefner himself is, uh, has managed to have himself photographed as a typical architect, right? With the model of his, of his building, with even his pipe pointing out to, to the different features of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the building, exactly like, uh, like any architect uh, uh, will do. The magazine was filled with interior from the very first uh, issue. Uh, it's not just uh, features and articles about interiors, but also in the sense that they recommend you to buy. That's actually also something uh, very new. I mean, women's magazine were already re kind of recommending you to buy this or that, but it, it, this is uh, inaugurate the whole new era of telling you uh, how to buy and includes, of course, all these modern uh, furniture, uh, hi-fi, uh, equipment uh, is very important. Uh, the shoes, of course, lighting, uh, the dress code, uh, the bath, the, the robes, and uh, are hugely uh, important. All the way to the mixing of a good martini, you can see that not uh, uh, detail of domestic space is left uh, untouched. The very first uh, page of the first issue of the magazine, facing the editorial, shows this cartoon of the proud uh, Playboy. Uh, that we saw before at home in his pyjamas and his bathrobe, standing beside his modern uh, for furniture, particularly the hard oil, uh, butterfly chair of 1940, which be will become a kind of signature piece in the Playboy uh, interior. It's almost uh, the most, uh, here, this one, and the Sarin and Guam chair are the most popular uh, chairs yeah, in Playboy, and it seems to act also as a kind of uh, uh, portable uh, house for the for the playmate. So if the apartment is for the uh, Playboy, uh, there is this uh, portable uh, house for the playmate. Already in the second, uh, here is again the hardoy chair and the hard, uh, hardoy chair. Already in the second issue, this feature of naked uh, playmates keeps describing in detail the uh, modern design flooring and furnishing of the California ranch style house the models are photographed uh, in. So rather than talk about the women, they are talking about uh, uh, how the floor, I mean, like it's nothing is, is, uh, is happening. The bedroom is this, the, the flooring has been done with that, the lighting is this way, and the first sentence of the articles automatically say, some say you can just uh, a, a man by the way he furnishes uh, his home. And so the article uh, symptomatically begins as he, in what will become a kind of mantra uh, uh, for the magazine. No? The, you can just a man by the, the way he's, uh, it's kind of interesting also to look at these images because you realize that uh, women at, the, at this point uh, come in all kinds of uh, shapes and, and forms and that by the standards of today, some people will think that that's not even, uh, uh, you know, uh, so it's, it's also curious to see how our ideas of beauty have changed. Design is the key to the uh, Playboy, of course, lifestyle. Franjo Wright and Wallace Harrison are praised in their fourth issue for bringing modern design to the house and the skyscraper. Uh, they write about the exciting simplicity of modern architecture, which obviously stimulates uh, Playboy more than the, than the center force. They don't ever say to you how much this woman excites you, but the modern simplicity of modern architecture is very exciting. I'm not, I'm not uh, inventing the word. Those are the words you will see that they use themselves. Um, the role of, uh, of Playboy becomes even more clear when in the next uh, issue they provide a guide to the 25 steps that are necessary for a successful conquest. <laughs> and they... <laughs> <laughs> It's kind of <laughs> reminiscent of all these uh, studies of the efficient uh, uh, living, system, that this is totally uh, inefficient, right? Um, this, and the sequence is uh, actually mapping in, the, in this modern apartment as if the layout and the equipment itself were choreographing the dance of seduction. 
as the Playboy maneuvers his prey towards the bed, each detail of the apartment assists in the movement. It's not by chance that the journey begins with the lightweight uh, curves of the butterfly um, chair and the deep sensuous fall of uh, Eros Arinen 1946 womb chair, which is, by the way, another signature um, chair of Playboy here in the cover, but also, uh, you know, Playmates uh, lounging in, uh, in the Sarinen uh, chair. In other words, it is as if the designers themselves are in the room helping out with the uh, seduction. And in fact, this is a, a, an article uh, of uh, Playboy in which they ask all these uh, major designers of the 1950s to come to New York uh, for this photo shoot, and, and you know, I found it uh, accidentally working on the inch. You know how it is in the archives, you get bored at a certain point, and uh, you know, it, it takes a long time. Look, it comes out as a nice article, but nobody talks about the months that you spend in the archives digging through. And then I was there one day, bored, looking at something, and I said, Playboy, Playboy? Right, and there is the letter of invitation in which they are inviting him to come to this uh, photo shoot. But you know, you would think that all these people that were so busy, and they have to come from California, from Crumb, I don't know, this is, this is tough, no? And they, on a particular day, they all accepted immediately, right? And you will think that they, they will say, well, uh, how much money are you paying? Nada. You know, they don't talk about that. You know what they are worried about? This is really fascinating. What do I wear? <laughs> what do I wear? So all these things, you know, you always think that the women are the only ones that are concerned with their appearance. The only thing they were, they, they were sure they had to be in Playboy, of course, I mean, they are not stupid, uh, but uh, uh, seven million uh, uh, readers, seven million copies, how many readers is that? I don't know, 28 millions. Uh, but uh, the important thing is do, how, do, how, do, how do I look like, what do I wear, right? So they are, in a way, assisting in the design. The Playboy apartment is kind of a cocktail of modern design, martinis, and music, uh, far from uh, simply providing an array of seductive images. Uh, sorry, um, Playboy analyzes the architecture of seduction. It offers a kind of user manual to the reader, and in the end, the sophisticated Playboy needs to know much more about modern design than about women. And how sophisticated uh, Playboy was, it became clear to me when we started looking ab about this Hardoy chair and this Arena uh, chair and realized that uh, the Lakeshore Drive apartment in the early years, that's the way they were photographed. I would have always imagined that Miss apartments would be with Miss furniture. But no architectural magazines had these kind of images with, uh, where you have uh, like mid uh, 20th century uh, furniture, which clearly talks about how well informed Hefner uh, was. Everything in Playboy is seen through the lens of design. Even a spoof of uh, psychoanalysis offers a detailed drawing of the couch and the plan of the room. Likewise, the movement of uh, furniture is broken down as are the precise movements of martini uh, production. Playboy relentlessly dissects every uh, and each dimension of the interior. This dedication to the perfected interior culminated in the September 1956. This is only three years into the magazine, and I show you the covers to see to show you how innocent, in fact, these covers are. It's, it's in, uh, incredible, right? You won't believe how hard, uh, what a hard time Princeton gave me when when I asked them to to buy the collection of of Playboy. I arrived there one day in September, and they said, "Well, what are you going to need this year for the for the reading in your class?" I said, "Buy the whole run of." Uh, of, of Playboy, and and I have to repeat the, the thing like uh, like ten times because it's like it didn't kind of sink in. It was like okay, so finally they get it, and they didn't even they didn't even wanted to keep them in the library. I have to keep them in the in the PhD room uh, downstairs, which of course was very convenient for all my students, and so because we didn't have to go out to the library and say, uh, but you know, I say, I say, why don't you keep them in the library? They say, oh, no, 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 this is uh, you know dangerous uh, material. You don't know what the students are going to do with this. Say, but, uh, have, have you heard about the internet? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> they are all there with their laptops and this stuff. <laughs> it was so hilarious. <laughs> then in the meantime, this uh, old librarian, Francis, I love her. I mean, she was so incredible. 
uh, and so fantastic. And, and but a young woman came very organized, and she really knows the value of uh, playboys. Now she put them in the rear room, so you have to uh, only can consult them from nine to five, and you have to wear gloves, uh, <laughs> which is even more kinky. And somebody has to be in the room too. <laughs> so, 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 in case you do something. So, Okay, so we have gone from having them in the PhD room, in the middle of all the other stuff, etc., to now you have to go with gloves, make an appointment. I don't know. So we, they, they never was a normal uh, uh, moment. Anyway, back to these very innocent uh, 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 covers of 1956, when Playboy, for the first time, designed uh, their uh, lavishly kind of illustrated uh, apartment. Uh, in eight pages spread, which is longer than any typical uh, feature, and continue with six page, pages in the following issues, September and October. Rejecting, uh, these are some of the kind of atmospheric uh, renderings that they produce for this uh, apartment. Rejecting the convention, they say, in which the overwhelming percentage of homes is furnished by women, the point, uh, they say, was create an interior that is unambiguously masculine with equipment, they don't say that, but I tell you that, with equipment that stays and women that come and go. A man, they write, yearns for, quarter, yearns for quarters of his own. More than a place to hang his hat, a man dreams of his own domain, a place that is exclusively his. Playboy has designed, pl planned, and decorated from the floor up a penthouse apartment for the urban uh, uh, bachelor. And this is very important, the question of the urban, because uh, uh, Playboy uh, defends the city. So in the, in the face of the suburbanization of America, uh, Playboy is, uh, is reclaiming uh, uh, the city, which is also a kind of progressive uh, move in that sense. Atmospheric renderings, as I say, conjure up this landscape of entertainment, which each successive um, space describes in great detail with all the individual items separately identified, including the designer, the manufacturer, the, pr the price. There are no uh, cabinets and imsans are in uh, tables, uh, no Gucci tables, etc., etc. The house is also full of all the latest electronic and media. A signature feature, of course, is the electronic entertainment center with hi-fi, FM, radio, TV, tape recording, movie, and slide projectors. Media is hugely important uh, for Playboy. And the entire environment can be controlled uh, from the bed, which is, of course, the epicenter of this idealized uh, interior. But in fact, the imagine, uh, let's say, occupant, uh, driver of the space is, in fact, the reader. In kind of a canny uh, seduction, the magazine describes the most advanced interior architectural design for a man perhaps very much like you, eh? the reader or the reader's fantasy, is the client and he's offer the keys uh, to the apartment in the very first uh, page of the article. This is the funny thing. Architecture turned out to be much more seductive than the play image. The penthouse feature was the most popular in, in the magazine that Eva was, if you just by the number of letters that the uh, magazine received. Architecture became, in that sense, the ultimate playmate, the only one allowed uh, to stay. Playboy received hundreds of letters requesting more information on the house, asking for more detailed plans and where to buy the furniture. Eh? And here you have some, you just finished reading the article on the Playboy penthouse apartment in your September issue. You have outdone yourself. We cannot begin to describe the excitement we feel. Okay, the excitement we feel, I mean, this is, I'm, I'm saying, I'm not inventing uh, the words. They don't write about the, the center force. They write about the architecture. We cannot begin to describe this excitement we feel. All we know is that we wish to do something about it, and they have dream of this building such an apartment and they want, we are serious about wishing to duplicate this in Atlanta as soon as possible, right? So it's also this kind of <laughs> immediate, yeah, as soon. And then look at the other one up there, my husband and I, so women are obviously also writing to Playboy to talk about the apartment, are extremely excited again about your September issue, the Playboy perhaps it's not just fabulous, there are so many ideas. And then I'm very interested in the equipment. So some people obviously want to duplicate the apartment and some people just want to know more details about the furniture you own, don't own the apartment, then maybe you want a lamp or a, uh, or a, or a chair that will already give you the sense that you are uh, in a Playboy. Um. In response to the enormous success of this uh, uh, feature, uh, Playboy started a series of features on Playboy pads 
that includes the weekend uh, hideaway of 1959, which you can see uh, in this uh, renderings. Uh, very interesting, the Playboy townhouse of 1962, uh, which was originally commissioned to be Hefner's uh, house, and it's a kind of Paul Rudolph's uh, town uh, house with this swimming pool in the center, which reminds me also very much of the Josephine Baker uh, swimming pool of, in the house of Adolf Loos for, for Josephine Baker, where everybody could look uh, into these crystalline uh, waters, presumably to uh, the naked uh, women uh, swimming in this uh, in this pool. Here, uh, more details of the Playboy uh, townhouse, which, as you can see, is also uh, furnished with uh, uh, sarin and furniture, etc. For the first time, the round uh, bed is introduced, which again all this electronic uh, equipment, and of course, again all the details of all the uh, designs, which become increasingly sophisticated, are given in the uh, article, and again, the most amazing thing uh, happened, uh, hundreds and hundreds of letters, people extremely excited about to compliment you for running the article on the Playboy Townhouse. It is a very sophisticated, attractively modern solution to in-town living, blah, blah, blah. In the past, Playboy has pr uh, provided its readers with the Playboy penthouse and the weekend hideaway. I have always admired the wonderful taste and elegance in these articles this time, however, Playboy has outdone itself. Uh, the Playboy Townhouse was not only enjoyable uh, reading, but it's also an outstanding example of blah, blah, blah. And of course, you know, there's always someone that doesn't like it, like this uh, Sandy Jorgensen from Miami, Florida, we have never hear about. I don't know whether it's a man or a, wo or a woman. But it says, your Playboy Townhouse is a wonderful, sleek collection of architectonically says, but hardly architecture. And okay, you can say that, but then look at who wrote here. Uh, eh? Richard Neutra, <laughs> a very, very long letter about how excited he is about this, uh, this house. Uh, after all kinds of adventures of my own, and after four years of skillfully and deftly taking girls through houses, you have given me uh, a pr proof, the Playboy townhouse, of this one truth which I have always protested and proclaimed. They have been done much back into the sign, and, and et cetera, et cetera. So there he is, in a way, not only admiring uh, the house, the Playboy townhouse uh, as published in the magazine, but in a way, uh, trying to write about how he has uh, uh, worked on four uh, continents and how he basic basically is offering himself in a kind of subtle way. He could also be designing something uh, for Playboy. So the architects themselves are not only very happy to be represented in the magazine, but they use the medium of the letters to the editor to kind of uh, uh, push themselves uh, into, uh, into the magazine. In addition to this, the uh, Playboy also designed the Playboy uh, Patio Terrace of 1963. Uh, here it is. It's like a <laughs> uh, or the uh, Playboy uh, Duplex House of 1970, and so on. Here is the Playboy Town House of 1970. Are, by the way, it's also uh, very important. Bill uh, Hunter from uh, Architectural Review brought me this uh, article uh, today. Uh, which uh, talk about uh, uh, in a magazine who talks about how uh, you could have made uh, 120 uh, millions of fortune today if you had invested 100K uh, in 1962 because of course the art uh, along with the uh, furniture that, uh, uh, that Playboy uh, recommended was pretty, uh, uh, pretty interesting. So you could be doing pretty well by, by answering, by, by following their, their advice. Um, the, uh, in each one of these uh, apartments, they, I don't know for what reason they return to the rectangular bed here, but the point here is that in each case of these apartments, the fantasy is the same. The bachelor and his equipment <coughs> are able to control every aspect of the interior environment to choreograph the successful conquest and subsequent erasure of all, tra of all traces of the previous process in preparation for the context of the next uh, uh, one. Media equipment is given a special attention. There is all these things called the Playboy Entertainment uh, Wall, electronic entertainment wall. And, and uh, here is the Playboy Wanderer uh, uh, Wall. And some of my students were very interested in this uh, aspect of the, of the, as well as in surveillance. Surveillance is huge. Uh, in, 
in Playboy, uh, here is, for example, the control room. It's almost like a, a big brother house of the big mansion where you see Hefner that he can control what is happening at, in any room in the, in the mansion at any one uh, given moment. So it's like an in, an in anticipation of the, of the big brother uh, house, you have this kind of situation. Playboy architecture ultimately turns on the bed, which becomes increasingly sophisticated and outfitted with all sorts of entertainment and communication devices as a kind of uh, control room. The magazine devoted a number of articles to the design of the, perfected, uh, of the perfect bed, and once again, uh, Hefner acted as the model with his famous uh, round bed uh, introduced as a feature in the townhouse of 1962 that you just saw, originally commissioned to be his own house, and then, of course, installed in the Playboy mansion. It's not by chance at all that the only uh, piece of the townhouse to be fully realized was the bed. The bed itself, you can argue, is a house. Its rotating, vibrating structure is packed with, listen to this, fridge, high foam, uh, hi-fi, telephone, filing cabinets, bar, microphone, dictaphone, video cameras, headphones, television, breakfast tables, working uh, tables, control for all the uh, lighting fixtures, etc., and etc., for the man, of course, that never wants to leave. The bed was literally Hefner's office, his place of business where he conducted interviews, made phone calls, selected images, adjusted layouts, edited tests, ate, drank, and consulted with playmates. So if Playboy, <laughs> I have no evidence that he had any sex there, you know? I really think that he is not very sexual. This is the interesting <laughs> thing, right? That the architecture is what is sexy. Not, not, you know, this is a cover up. This central falls, uh, anyway, we'll discuss later. That. <laughs> but the point for me is that the Playboy is all about architecture and that this uh, architecture is an extension uh, of the bed. The Playboy interior is finally all uh, bed. And it, that, in a way, I think also anticipates the situation of us today in which we spend so much more time in bed. We use the, the, the bed with all our electronic uh, uh, devices, a much more public space. In, in many ways, when I see him in bed, I say, well, you know, that's not just me, but many other people too. A lot of teenagers are in bed, you know, connecting to so many different uh, things they do their work. So, and also this idea of remaining in this contemporary recluse, I think, and in, in a way gave us a, an image of our future uh, somehow. Uh, Playboy uh, made it, and those are some of the topics that uh, Playboy was uh, working on. I give you a, a kind of more detailed uh, view of the thing, which includes womanization and feminism, drug addiction, obscenity, uh, capital punishment, alcoholism, birth control, teenagers, abortion, venereal diseases, divorce, sex, uh, uh, etc. So there you go. Of course, in, in, uh, in, uh, in many ways, uh, you will look down on, on Playboy. In other words, they are incredibly uh, progressive. They were in favor of, uh, of the pill. They were for abortion, et cetera, et cetera. This is a, uh, in a country in which they are still thinking that, uh, that they shouldn't be giving you birth control. Right? It shouldn't be covered by the, by the national health insurance that we don't have anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, as I said, Playboy, uh, or as I was trying to say, Playboy made it acceptable for men to be interested in modern uh, architecture and design. Uh, readers were encouraged to think that they could have a piece of this idealized interior in his own uh, uh, life. This is, of course, reinforced in the advertisement. This is actually an advertisement for unbrinkable uh, slacks, uh, which has, of course, the uh, Miss Van der Rohe Barcelona a uh, uh, chair, uh, uh, for a space for, for making out, or in the Bertoya uh, chair, and, uh, and so many others. Because these uh, uh, desire objects in the end are by the most sophisticated designers of the time. They start with Mies and, and, and Bertoya, Sarina, and etc. But then they move to things like Alan Gold, or here is Sarinen, or these great uh, Italian uh, lighting uh, fixtures, or golf equipment, or Le Corbusier's uh, chair, or uh, you will go to the 70s and you have things like the new domestic landscape uh, at MoMA, 
which of course introduced all the work of uh, uh, Andrea Branci, Arquizón, Columbus, etc., to the American uh, public, and this is the, um, the amazing thing between two weeks uh, Playboy, who was very much in the know, has already not only covered the new domestic landscape, but presented in this uh, very <laughs> exciting uh, uh, way, in which you, you can see all these uh, chairs of Roberto Mata, Arquizón, etc., uh, but sexualized. You have uh, Ero Arneo, you, when the inflatables come, there is a Playboy with inflatable uh, furniture. They will recommend you to buy uh, Columbus uh, cabinets or the Olivetti letter. So their recommendations were uh, very good. If you did pretty well if you bought what, uh, what uh, Playboy told you or recommended you. Down to uh, the Frank Gehry uh, cardboard uh, chair, at the time that these chairs, uh, well, at least the simple one, was only $37 at, at Bloomingdale. Playboy uh, had it in the list of things that you should that you should buy. So maybe you didn't would do so well as with the art, but you definitely could do uh, very well with the with the furniture as well. In fact, I had a, a woman in at Cornell. I was once giving a lecture, uh, and I have started to think about this. And I say something kind of from the top of my head, you know, like a comment of the cuff, like uh, I think Playboy did more for the dissemination of modern architecture and design in America and at the Museum of Modern Art and, uh, and any kind of design uh, magazine. And, and at the end of the, of the, of the conference or the lecture, this woman comes to me and she says, now I know why my father, who never set foot in a museum, who doesn't know anything about architecture or design <laughs> <laughs> or art, has the most amazing collection of <laughs> Sarinen chairs, <laughs> Frank Gehry chairs, and I, you know, so he, he, uh, he asked me, why, why do you buy these, these, uh, these, these chairs? He said, Playboy told me to buy them, so, you know, you know, thousands and millions of, of men bought this uh, furniture. Maybe the success of all these designers after the war had a lot to do with, uh, with, uh, uh, with Playboy. And these uh, 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 designers, as I say, are incredibly uh, sophisticated. Perhaps you think after seeing the apartment of Playboy that the uh, Playboy architecture was a little bit more, more tame, but eventually Playboy uh, uh, architecture caught up with the furniture in the sense that the somewhat generic rectangular <coughs> mid-century modern of the Playboy design apartments gave way to more extreme concepts of architecture as the magazine decided to appropriate already existing houses as play paths instead of designing in themselves. So, for example, you have Charles Moore, New Haven, New Haven, Heaven, uh, presented in Playboy in 1969 as a Playboy uh, pad. And you have to remember that, or maybe you don't know, but this is interesting to know that Charles Moore at that time was the dean of Yale, so more stuffy than that you don't get, right? But he seemed, doesn't seem to have any problem presenting his own. It's kind of perverse to also because uh, Charles Moore was gay, right? So he, he's in the closet, but still he's gay, and the apartment instead is being presented as this kind of uh, heterosexual uh, fantasy with two couples, one doesn't know exactly what's going on, but, uh, but, it's <laughs> but it's definitely not gay. Or maybe it is, anyway. So another um, uh, 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 interesting uh, appropriation is this uh, portable uh, playhouse of Mati uh, Surunen of 1970s, uh, a portable house that you can take, of course, to the uh, countryside, or you can take it to the beach, or you can go snow, uh, skiing and take it <laughs> with you, and it, of course, is totally uh, 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 sexualized. Uh, the John Lobner um, Elroth House of 1971 was also chosen by Playboy as a Playboy pad and presented in the magazine, uh, inhabited and in this color photography. It's very important to know that at that time, architectural magazines, uh, color photography is still very expensive, no? And architectural magazine has this kind of uh, black and white cover. So this is uh, actually most of the time the best uh, publication. It's also interesting uh, to think about this uh, uh, in terms of James Bond. Uh, Diamonds Are Forever, who uses exactly the same uh, house, probably inspired by uh, a Playboy uh, for uh, a setting for, for this film. And of course, there's always a play between James Bond and, and Playboy, in as much as James Bond also presents himself in this film as a member of the Playboy uh, uh, club. You have things like, uh, uh, even more extreme things, like the Bubble House of Chris Alice of 1972, that I don't think many architectural magazines would have even bothered 
uh, to publish, and here you have it, or the unfarm uh, house of the <laughs> of the uh, of the century uh, in of 1973, which you have uh, here, uh, which is again color uh, uh, photographs. Um, uh, which become all uh, models of seduction uh, through design. So it is no longer one or two carby designed chairs that prop up the comely girl next door at the heart of the Playboy core fantasy, but fully, fully realized buildings and interiors by leading experimental uh, architects uh, as and farms that are some filled with women that also seem to become more sophisticated uh, along with the architecture, as if design, in a way, intensifies and elevates uh, the fantasy. Some very high-profile architects, such as Franjo Wright, Miss van der Rohe, and uh, uh, Bucky Fuller, uh, were the subject of features and interviews in the magazine as major cultural figures, perfectly dressed and symptomatically celebrated by their masculine, uh, for their masculine sophistication with subtle and also subtle hints that the two are uh, also uh, that they are two playboys. In the very first issue, for example, Franjo Wright was already praised as an uncommon man who thumps around in his jaguar, has a controversial love life, and radical, exciting uh, buildings. Right? So the fact that he has a controversial uh, love life, that's the thing that was doing him in the practice because he was losing clients and uh, you know, it was in the architectural world that was not seen as, as very good. But for Playboy, that's super, that's super hot, right? <laughs> <laughs> the, architects, the architect in a way becomes like a model that is carefully posed at the very heart of the Playboy uh, fantasy. It is as if the architect's dream of the future is fused with the dreams of a sexual context. Here is Miss Van der Rohe, Van der Rohe. Slenderella in the, is the, in the sky is a reference to the Lakeshore Drive apartments that had just been uh, uh, completed. It's not by chance that uh, the magazine presents the vast floating megastructures of uh, a fuller city of the future. Uh, we are talking uh, here about 5,000 living units on each side of this uh, uh, three-phase uh, uh, pyramid. In, with enough room for a, for a garden, uh, etc. You have also uh, things like Moses of this uh, habitat built for the Expo 67 in Montreal, but as a fragment of a possible uh, future city. Or you can think about uh, Paolo Soleri here publishing in, in Playboy the cathedral cities for a new uh, society. Thousands of independent apartments, units are stacked up in, in this vast science fiction uh, forms. The architect stands at the edge of the future, visualizing the possible trajectory of the sign. The playboy never goes out of the house, uh, but dreams of flying toward the future in this kind of sealed domestic uh, landscape. The playboy interior finally swallows everything, even its own future. This is the kind of things that you find you find when you go the other way around to go to the archives of Bucky Fuller to see what there is about Playboy. And not there, only there are images that were never published, but also letters and other documents that demonstrate that he wanted to do a lot more <laughs> than he was he ever uh, did. That he wanted to do a whole complex of, of things that never was uh, finally uh, uh, realized. In the end, uh, this uh, continuously expanded wall of design is itself, of course, a sexual fantasy, a space the reader is skillfully seduced into. The more detailed the description, the more intensely the reader desires to get in, of course. To subscribe to Playboy is to get a, key, a set of keys to a dream-like uh, world, a magical uh, interior, with this massive uh, circulation, which, as I said before, at its peak in 1972, uh, Playboy sold more than 7 million uh, copies, and its sexualization of architecture, you can say that Playboy uh, had more influence on the dissemination of modern design than professional magazines, interior magazines, and even institutions like the Museum of Modern Art. And I give you again the example of the new domestic landscape. 1972 is the peak of the readership of, um, of uh, Playboy, but it's also the year of the new domestic landscape exhibition. Well, this is... Uh, Roberto Mata chairs on Playboy, and here is Roberto Mata uh, uh, chair uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, the Museum of Modern Art, which I think is incredibly sexual uh, as well, but uh, something else is happening, or Archithun Mies chair uh, at MoMA, or Archithun 
Mr. Uh, in, in, uh, in Playboy, maybe hundreds of, uh, of, of thousands of people, a few hundreds of thousands will be huge audience uh, for the Museum of Modern Art, but we are talking about seven million copies and therefore uh, possibly 28 or more uh, million uh, uh, readers. Design was not simply featured in the magazine, as I said before, but was its very mechanism. And of course, uh, designers were readers uh, too. If Playboy couldn't exist without architecture, it seems as if architecture couldn't exist, as you will see in the next uh, part of the, of the lecture, and with this I will finish without Playboy. I, even uh, architects like, uh, like the Ims or Sarin, uh, Sarin and seem to adopt themselves the figure of the playboy. Look at how Sarin is looking at this, with his eyes, right? And, and the way in which they, they dress up with their kind of uh, context. Well, I say that, uh, that architecture could not exist without playboy because uh, the magazine deeply affected the imagination of critics uh, and architects. Here you have Siegfried Gideon that actually uh, uses Playboy uh, to criticize the architecture of the 1960s when he says that at the moment a certain confusion exists in contemporary architecture, as in painting, a kind of pause, even a kind of exhaustion, everyone is aware of it, fatigue is normally accom accompanied by, a by uncertainty, what to do, where to go, fatigue is the mother of indecision, opening the door to escapism, to superficialities of all kinds, a kind of Playboy architecture is in bulk, he says uh, uh, finally, an architecture treated as playboy street life, jumping from one sensation to another and quickly bored with everything. So this is the condemnation of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Gideon. Uh, here, Gideon on playboy architecture, this uh, fragment, this introduction to the fourth edition to space, time, and architecture ended up being published as articles uh, as Siegfried Gideon on playboy, or here in this uh, German uh, magazine, where through the images you can already get a sense of the kind of architecture that he considers uh, playboy architecture, which is of course all the architects of the of the Lincoln Center will 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 qualify as uh, as uh, as playboy. Uh, Hughes uh, H. Stevens, this beautiful building in, in Berlin, all the buildings that we now love, like the, the House of the Culture of the Wall in in uh, in Berlin, or uh, Robert Guedes or uh, Edward Darlestone in the uh, Brussels uh, pavilion, they're all playboys. Of course, Sarinen uh, and Gordon Bursak are playboys. Uh, Yamasaki is a playboy, and in fact, maybe he is onto uh, something that there was a lot of sex in this, uh, in this architecture. More interesting from the side of uh, uh, critics is the uh, attitude of uh, Banham. With in, with who in this very stuffy magazine, I show you what the magazine looked like, the Architects' Journal, April 7, 1960. Well, in this very uh, conventional magazine, he writes this article uh, uh, with the title, I will crawl a mile for Playboy, in which he writes that, of course, I buy for his giant fold-out full-color pinups. Playboy Playmates are one of America's greatest gifts uh, to Western culture, and you know how I go for culture. But if I was a working hypocrite, I could find a dozen other reasons for keeping abreast of Playboy, item, architecture, and interior design. I will repeat that to show I'm not kidding architecture and interior design. I found that uh, uh, very late into this research, and you know, I had always had this question of how uh, come nobody has noticed before that there was so much architecture in Playboy. Actually, Banham had noticed and has pointed out to us already in 1960, hey, there is a lot of architecture on this, and I will repeat to show that I'm not kidding <laughs> in Playboy, and nevertheless, we were not capable uh, uh, to see it uh, uh, yet. So, it's not by uh, uh, chance, I mean, he also wrote uh, letters to, to the editor, as you can see, Rainer Banhan, admiring different aspects of the, of the magazine. Playboy plays a huge uh, uh, part in, in Banham uh, publications, Triumph of Software, Barbarella, etc., and Playboy are part of his set of uh, references. It's also interesting that it's not just Banham, but that the uh, imagination of uh, uh, architects of, uh, of this period is also extremely influenced by the arrival of, uh, of Playboy. For example, uh, it's impossible to think of uh, Hans Hollein uh, Bau, 
Bao is the magazine that um, Hans Kollein edited uh, in those years of the, of the 60s, and it's impossible to think about it. In fact, he recognizes it because we will interview him for the clip stand uh, fall, and he was telling us how he went to, to the Soviet Union uh, to interview uh, uh, Leonidov, and uh, they realized the situation in, in the Soviet Union was so difficult that uh, it was better to put all the photographs and all the documents of uh, Leonidov in a suitcase and take it to Vienna and, and come back and, 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 uh, and, and return it at a later moment. And I thought to myself, oh, this is like a Cold War story. And he was talking about the difficulties in the frontier and how they wanted to confiscate. And, and I said, I thought he was going to say confiscate the material of Leonidov. And then he said, confiscate my Playboy. So he was really upset <laughs> that they have confiscated his Playboy. So sometimes I was like, a, <laughs> the materials of Leonidov were gone because of this idiot or, or this young person that thought that he could take the mina now. And then went, no, 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 it was his Playboy. So of course, you know, of course they were all reading uh, uh, Playboy and it's uh, uh, clearly uh, there. Archigram, for example, has uh, a Playboy in their survival kit of 1963. Among the things that you need to have to survive it includes a, a Playboy. Actually, in the regular shelters of America, among the things like the blankets and the ballion and the, and the things included the Playboy, of course, and the Scrabble, uh, and uh, you have to have uh, a Playboy uh, too. Playboy is a product of, of the Cold uh, uh, War. Already in the first issue, Hefner uh, wrote that Playboy was offered as a diversion for the anxieties of the atomic age, and the Playmates uh, uh, line up the interior walls of Kunset huts, and Playboy features in films such as Doctor, and there are a lot of cartoons about the, the, uh, the Cold War, but I'm sure that was only Thunder, Mr. Putman, or uh, if we are attacked, Mrs. Jennings, there is room in my shelter for you, but for no other neighbors. And uh, as I say, uh, um, a pl uh, Playboy was also featured in films such as Doctor Strange, uh, Love, and uh, Apocalypse uh, uh, Now. So in conclusion, from the furniture to the clothes, to the lighting, the music, the food, the drinks, the conversations, the jokes, the ideas, the art, the architecture, the smells, and even the way to move, to act, everything is provided. The magazine, in that sense, created a total work of art. When you open the pages of the magazine, you were invited to dive into a world without gaps, without cracks, without decay, an infinite, perfected interior, a total work of art. Thank you very much. Actually, I forgot to show you images of the exhibition in, uh, at the NIE in Maastricht, but I'll do it very quickly. These are uh, a first part of the exhibition where there is the whole set of uh, Playboys that I made Princeton to ask are, are there, and actually you can touch them. And, and uh, we provide gloves too, so to make it. Uh, <laughs> and you see, he, there is this uh, bunny ears that indicate every time in an issue there is something about architectural design. So that will give you a sense, I don't know whether you see with the light, how many, uh, 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 practically all the issues, I mean, it's rarely one issue doesn't have any, but most issues has more than one, uh, which are color coded depending if it's an advertisement or if it's furniture or if it's uh, an, an interview or a feature on an architect. Yeah. <laughs> more Playboy. And, and of course, people are there very concentrated. Uh, <laughs> this is the editor of, uh, of Volume, Arjen. Uh, and another section was dedicated to the making of uh, Playboy uh, uh, magazine, everything that uh, had to do with this. The city was hugely important for Playboy, not just the fantasy cities of the future, but the city of Chicago. So there was a section on the city. Upstairs, we dedicated to the Playboy uh, pad, uh, including models of the Playboy uh, townhouse and a bed, the original uh, rectangular uh, bed where you could lie down and watch the uh, films and look at all the uh, um, documentation of the Playboy pad. In another section, we I don't have pictures, but it's difficult to photograph, but we have the round bed. Also, you could lie down there and watch uh, films of, uh, of Playboy. 
uh, this is still the rectangular bed. Uh, this part is dedicated to the Cold War, so reproduce some kind of an idea of a concept hat, and all the documents here have to do with the Cold War. Uh, uh, ah, the bunny, everything having to do with uh, transportation and the big bunny is in this section. The grotto, which I say is hugely important, is there, including films of in the grotto and the closet, because if they ask you to buy so many things, where do you put them in the end? So it's that the Playboy needed a closet if they, they don't talk about the closet uh, uh, with all these uh, things. The chairs, which include the original chairs, but also the way in which they were represented in Playboy. And finally, control room, which is all about surveillance in Playboy. And at the end of the exhibition, you realize you yourself have been surveyed, so you can see your own <laughs> film. All right, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, other questions? Did you? Sorry, I'm going to kind of help. Hi. Hi, Patrice. Thank you for your Hi. talk. That was great. Um, I just have a question. At the start of the lecture, you showed us the, the first issue of Playboy, and you, they mentioned this kind of idea of against exteriority. They kind of, I was wondering if you've ever considered Playboy as a project to domesticate modern man. Yes. Uh, and what are your thoughts on that? A dom domesticate modern man. We see, that's interesting that you use the word domesticate, because that's what they are against. Yeah, I mean, yeah that's, that's what I think they are being... Uh, uh, Dom domesticated precisely by being excluded from from the house and uh, I'm forced to deal only with the uh, with the lawn and, and and maybe they have a room where they tinker with the stuff they do yourself of the of the of the of the 1950s. So cl claiming uh, the interior mm -hmm. uh, is 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 kind of uh, uh, is the opposite mm -hmm. in a way, right? So not, uh, I don't know, domesticate uh, modern man. Is it domestication? Is it? Francesca, what do you say? No, you don't know? No, I don't think it's domestication. No, it's not, right? It's very urban in the end, you know? It's more, con the fantasy resonates more with uh, our times. You know, this, this uh, question of the, uh, of this continuous interior that we, that we inhabit, in which we, it's like, like we all have become agoraphobic in a way, right? So we live in this kind of uh, bubble and we move from one bubble to another bubble. And <laughs> increasingly, uh, uh, there is less uh, outside, right? Yeah. So it's a metaphor of our times, I would say. Yeah. Thanks for that, Beatrice. Uh, quick question. Um, you speak the whole time about the kind of audience for this material. For the audience? For, for, the, for the audience of this material. Yes. But who is the author? You know, is, is it all coming from Hefner himself as the kind of editorial godhead? Or is there another board or is there a figure? Or right. you know, who, who is the person who's basically fueling this? Um, mania for architecture and interior design? Yeah, that's a very interesting uh, uh, question. We tried to find out, and we went to, to Chicago, and we tried to talk with all the surviving uh, uh, people, like the guy, for example, that was the, the um, art editor of the, of the magazine, who is now like 85 years old and lives in the Hank uh, Tower. And we went to interview him. We have this long, and he, he says, no, I mean, there was nobody that was he, Hefner himself was the one that was obsessed uh, with architecture of design. One anecdote that is interesting is that he was interested before Playboy. There is, for example, an article in a newspaper before he starts Playboy where he is in a modern apartment in Chicago with his wife and his uh, little kid, uh, uh, Christy, who is the one that then, then ran the, the corporation, right? And they are in a thoroughly modern apartment full of uh, mid-century design. And the anecdote is that he sold all his collection of modern, which shortly afterwards they separated, of course, but they, he sold his collection of modern uh, furniture that was uh, extensive enough at that point to finance the entire run of the first uh, issue. So he was already interested in, in architecture before uh, Playboy. He understands uh, uh, or he sees architecture as part of the 
Playboy cannot exist without architecture. That's basically. But of course, he had a team with people that that were working on on, on all kinds of uh, different aspects, from the from the articles and uh, and the interviews to to millions of people. I mean, they asked the as the at the beginning, no, at the beginning they are like two cats. But uh, once the the magazine starts getting uh, important, they have a big uh, a big staff. But nobody could point out to anybody that say, oh, no, this was the guy uh, that was pushing the architecture. And it's also very curious how it ends up all, right? When he moves to LA and when he moves into this mansion, which is not modern uh, anymore, there's nothing modern about the, the mansion in, in, uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, uh, that's it, the magazine also at the same time uh, uh, stops uh, uh, being that interesting in terms of architecture. Stops, stops. Well, if, of course, it also coincides with a different moment, you know, with the beginning of postmodernism or also, sexuality had changed too. You know, after the sexual revolution, I don't think that Playboy had the same kind of uh, significance. Um, can I ask? A, well, is there another question around? Hi. Yes. I think coming back, coming back to the first question in yeah. terms of domesticity, it, it doesn't feel like it's domestication of the man. But I'm wondering to what extent it could be understood as a reaction mm -hmm. by men, for men, against the domestic environment that preceded yes. all of this, the domestic environment of the 1950s yes, that you'd worked yes. on before. Which they see as uh, completely oppressive, yes. right? For both men and women, by the way, right? So uh, the figure of the, of the, of, of the women, the, the ambition, you may have many problems with them, but definitely is not the, uh, uh, the housewife of the of the 1950s stuck in their suburb with their tiki taki houses, right? I mean, it's sort of connected to that, but maybe like further down the the road. I suppose one way of interpreting Playboy, <coughs> you've gone to, I mean, absolutely correct lengths to stress it's got the literature, mm -hmm. it's got the architecture. In a strange way, in the 50s, maybe actually Playboy is a magazine for gay men who are yeah. still in the closet. Yeah. And as it were, the female nudes are a disguise. Yeah. The people who look at the female nudes are the people who pick it up on the train. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's a, a kind of almost a, a, a kind of second constituency right. for the magazine. In which case, as it were, what they share with the heterosexual mm -hmm. is it's a sort of bachelor's space, right. which would be indifferent to whether you're, yeah. as it were, the bachelor. Mm -hmm. um, that's the, the sort of, you know, yeah, one yeah, part. Yeah, yeah. And no, I mean, I think the other question really is that, that there's almost a fabric mm -hmm. which you see, but it doesn't get quite as dominant. I mean, if for architecture it's the white walls, yes. the fabric which seems it's parallel mm -hmm. is black leather. Mm -hmm. And you know, maybe one could chart here mm -hmm. the architectural interior design use of black leather and then mm -hmm. its subsequent sexualization mm -hmm. in the same way that people have done the white wall. The white wall. You know, I mean, I'm not so sure about uh, it's all uh, black leather. There is a lot of white leather, too. You saw these chairs of Sarin with these women. But about the first part, this is definitely part of what I arrived to the, the, to the conclusion that we don't mind is precisely a reference to the fact that being telling you in advance that we are interested in, in interior design, we don't mind means that what they have to deal with is precisely homophobia, that if you were a man interested in interior decoration in 1950s and had a magazine like that, everybody would think that it's a queer magazine and therefore the women in the center for are the coys. This is not the main event and they are not very sexual by the, by the, by the way. I mean, I, you know, I'm interested in, por in pornography. I don't think that's, in, that's very, it's not very interesting. It's not pornography almost. It's, it's just like so lame, you know. <laughs> it's so lame. It's so <laughs> have you? I don't know. I don't know who gets turned on by that. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes. I have a last, uh, I have a, I, okay, I have a question. It's just because you told that not many people saw Playboy as an architectural yes. pursuit. And like you say, that was shown in 1960s, but nobody came across. But what was your first point, like when you realized Playboy had so much of architecture yes. and interior That's design. a very in interesting question because it was gradually and it kind of down on me all of a sudden, right? So I was working on the 1960s and 70s. As I say, we were doing the Clip Stanford magazine. We go and interview Hans Collin and he's telling us the whole story about how when he was doing bow, he was doing this and that and the other thing. And in the middle of that story, she tells a story of going to Russia, to, to the Soviet Union to do Leonidov and his Playboys were confiscated. Uh, that's all he seemed to be upset about. I thought to myself, okay, so that's a funny thing that Hans Hollein did. Okay, fine. And then I'm looking at, uh, uh, in the, the, the 60s and 70s is the material that I was working with. I'm uh, looking at this, uh, uh, at this uh, archigram uh, uh, survival kit. Ah, look at that, they have a Playboy. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, now I invite Chip Lord to give a lecture at Princeton because we were working on on uh, on Ant Farm and, uh, and all of that. And he sends me, of course, the typical thing. He sends me his CV, and I'm going through the CV to see how I'm going to introduce him. And I go like, okay, Playboy. Well, at some point I realize all these architects. Then Charles Moore. One day somebody was giving a, a, a working on on Charles Moore, and she said, you know that. Charles Moore apartment was on Playboy. So it was a, cum a cumulative, cumulative. At the point I realized, I've got to look at this Playboy. So that's why I asked them to buy the entire run without knowing what I was going to find. And in fact, we passed the entire semester, imagine our class, just pa you know, passing page by page and pointing out to every time there was architecture of design, whether it was uh, an article, whether it was an advertisement, whether it was, so just, plainly going through the issues and identifying every time and then trying to figure out what exactly uh, is going on. Yeah. <laughs> now, now you have in the library that you know, everyone would be reading Playboy, but some of them are secretly underneath reading Dan's <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Somebody wants a question. Um, it's more comic. Two references, maybe I was thinking when you were talking in partly Mark's comment or the comments about the domestic, domesticity of the space. Yeah. Barbara Ehrenreich's book, The Worst Years of Our Lives, talks about the start of Playboy as being a reaction against the idea of a living, of a family wage. Yes. And saying, you know, the idea of a, of a family wage, a man being earning money which has got to be divided with his, you know, wife and children. Yes. And she sees Playboy as a kind of way in which that wage is, is, yes. is tucked back to the center, to the to the male, the one, you know, the individual. Right. So maybe this is kind of purchasing power. This is what you're going to spend your money on, which is definitely not the family. Yeah. There's nothing. There's never a, a children's room. There's, you know, the child and the and the and the kind of reproductive female are what's missing yeah. from the Playboy. One. So it's just that was one right, if right. you come no, across no that. Reproduction got I know. Whatsoever, right? Yeah. This is the bachelor of fa fantasy. Mm. It's that the millions of uh, of America reproduce that fantasy inside their own houses. I mean, millions of Americans, for example, make themselves a round bed. Thinking I mean, I was have, there, yeah, that's I have what I'm seeing in my class. And he says, oh my God, my father have one of those. And he's, he asked his father, he, he, Playboy gave the instructions, so they build their own fantasies. Even uh, the majority of the readers were, uh, you know, heterosexual and had families and all of that, but they still reproduced that, that fantasy. It's a bit like the, the patterns you used to get in the women's magazine. To, you know, you can, you can make this. It's a yes. cut out and keep pattern. And yes. this is the kind of blueprint yes. that you can take home and yes. make. Yes. One other reference I was just going to share was that thinking of, um, again, about the, the, the closeted gay. The Rock Hudson character in Pillow Talk, where he's interested in, as soon as he ta starts talking about fabrics, uh, he's he's playing gay. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I think that's a that's a really interesting uh, interesting point. And Barbara, by the way, yeah, he was one of the first to to write about Playboy. Interestingly enough, I think the first uh, scholars of of Playboy were all gay. You know, if you think about uh, uh, the book that George Sanders put together at, at Princeton called Stad, uh, he had reproduced already the the Playboy uh, apartment. Or if you think about George Wagner and so on, so, so it's also symptomatic, I think, uh, that queer uh, theory took uh, the question of Playboy uh, 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 from the beginning. So it's a kind of a queer magazine in a way, too. <laughs> Yeah, 
Yes. Yeah, like it's always a heterosexual. In, uh, in the outside, it's a heterosexual. What I'm saying is that you can read into it all kinds of, uh, of different uh, uh, things. But it's, a hetero, it's an heterosexual fantasy, right? The fantasy of the bachelor who, in the city, has a girlfriend, and you know, and other things uh, happen. It will be also interesting, I think, to look at uh, parallel magazines such as Cosmopolitan. I realized when the editor of Cosmopolitan died uh, recently that uh, the magazine who existed in parallel with, uh, with uh, Playboy also advised young women to live in, in the city and had a li liberated sexual lifestyle, right? Um, except that uh, the recommendation for Cosmopolitan in terms of uh, arranging your apartment had nothing to do with what the Playboy uh, was doing. It was more like going to the flea market and finding that odd table or chair and making this kind of comfortable uh, nook here and that. It's also a different kind of ad uh, acquisitive uh, power. I mean, the women that Cosmopolitan were addressing were like the secretaries and the young women that were uh, for the first time working uh, in the city, not necessarily with a family, et cetera, et cetera. But that she was advocating uh, already kind of a sexual liberty, I mean, that the, the experimentation, that you shouldn't settle, with, and uh, on the contrary, you should have several partners before you marry, because otherwise you don't know what you're getting into. I mean, that, that existed at the same time that Playboy, that I think is interesting, but not for the architecture. All right. Okay. Um, I'd like to thank on your behalf. Yes, yes.